So, some time ago, I met a member of a managing board of a large multinational conglomerate. We started talking. And he was speaking to me about the state of his company. And while he was talking, his entire body language changed. His head and his shoulders dropped, his voice became soft and weak, and this otherwise charismatic leader turned into a mere shadow of himself. He told me that the financial situation of his company was excellent, but the mood wasn't. Nobody seemed to trust anybody anymore, and nobody seemed to enjoy working there anymore. It was clear to me that this executive was suffering from the climate in his own company. Then, suddenly, his posture changed, his back straightened, it's his voice regained its original strength, and his face was one big happy smile. Now he said, now finally things will be good again, because now we're getting a new CEO. I must say that I felt a bit bewildered by the somewhat bizarre excitement caused by the news of the arrival of a new CEO. Obviously, to this member of the board, a CEO has Superman qualities. So I asked him, sir, You've been a member of the managing board of this company for the last seven years. Please tell me, what have you done in these last seven years to improve the situation in your company and to rephrase the climate? The executive looked at me and with a devastating degree of honesty, he said, I? I can't do anything, you see? I'm only a board member. Good evening, fellow Tedsters. I wanted to share this real-life story with you as an illustration of a world of self-limiting beliefs that many of us choose to live in. What devastates me about the story is that we live in a world that really needs every helping hand it can get, and there is no space for self-limiting beliefs. So I want to talk to you today about the power we all have to make a difference. I want to talk to you about the power that lies in each one of us when we act on the basis of realizing that we all live in the same ecosystem, that we have a responsibility for ourselves and for others at the same time, and that, in fact, everything and everybody are interconnected. My career so far has taken me across a number of different countries, industries and functions, but it was particularly my time in the human resources field that made me realize that our current prevailing self-centered individualism and our short-sightedness needs to change because the world of tomorrow is demanding a new paradigm, a paradigm of systems thinking, mutual responsibility, and of interconnectedness. And I have a vision of a modern human being who has transcended the egoistic forms of behavior and who has developed a much stronger sense of we. And I believe that now is the right time for us to rethink our responsibilities and to act accordingly. And I believe that the current crisis we are going through are the best ideal starting point for all of us collectively to take this evolutionary step. So I want to share my vision and my ideas with you about how collectively we can make it work. So apparently, even board members have accepted the role of a passive observer, a silent critic or an inactive bystander. What worsens the situation, though, is that many of the problems that we are facing are anyway so complex, so connected, and potentially so devastating for mankind, that it would take anyway more than one superman to fix it. We watch how problems like youth unemployment, financial indebtedness, or water shortage get worse over the time, yet we don't seem to find a solution for it. Some time ago, I was watching CNN, as they were telling us that by the year 2030, there will be no more fish. Decades of overconsumption and overfishing were quickly depleting the stocks, yet nobody seemed to feel responsible for it. And all that reminds me of a cartoon of three gentlemen sitting in a sinking rowing boat. So as one of the gentlemen is sitting on the lower side of the boat, already up to his knees in water, he's trying to get the water out of the boat, the other two are sitting on the other side, nice and dry. So as these two gentlemen are watching the frantic survival efforts of their comrade, one of them says, ooh, that doesn't look good. And the third one says, ha, ah, who cares, it's not happening on our side. 
So it seems that our action, or maybe I should say our lack of action, first only impacts other people, and then it comes back sooner or later to impact, impact us. But the good news is that science has reached a level of clarity today that we have a much better understanding just how much our daily activities really do impact other people. And understanding how much we impact other people and how we impact other people is a great starting point for us to rethink our responsibility and for changing our behavior. So, if we look at science, we know that for some time now, we have obviously observed the convergence of ancient wisdom traditions and quantum philosophy. And we know that both of them actually describe the fundamental nature of our consciousness as being one of unity. But let's have a much deeper look into the field of epigenetics, which is a, mo a more recent field of science. Because the significant research that comes out of the field of epigenetics actually shows us that we are not at the mercy of our genes. Actually, we can now find out that we can actually also change our genes. Epigenetic markers are distributed on our, G on our DNA, and they switch on or they switch off our genes, which is why they are also called switches. But the fascinating thing here for me is that these switches actually are impacted and react to physical influences as much as to psychological influences, which means that everything that happens around us all the time has an impact on us, on our genes and the totality of our genome. And it doesn't stop there because we know that the new disposition of our genes can actually be passed on to one generation and another generation. I'll give an example. Whatever happens to a woman during pregnancy has an impact on the genome of her unborn child. And through this impact on the genome of the unborn child, it has an impact on the unborn's unborn children. So if I come back to the somewhat bizarre behavior of the board member in my earlier story, could it be that his own epi genes had switched on his self-limiting belief because somewhere, sometime, he had been influenced by the self-limiting beliefs of his parents. And could it be that somewhere along the way, this executive was not encouraged enough to assume responsibility? So today, as a member of the managing board of a company with 150,000 people, this executive feels powerless to initiate change even though many of us would probably consider that his position is particularly powerful. So you might ask yourself, how do we get there? How can we make this paradigm shift happen? What can each one of us do? To me, there are four different phases that need adjustment. And it all starts with the first phase, the prenatal phase, the phase before we are born. Why is it that we have to go through testing or through systematic training for all sorts of things in life, like driving a car, going fishing in the lake, raising a young dog in Switzerland, or starting any kind of profession. But why is there no test, not even systematic support for parents about how to educate their children? Why is it more important that we get trained how to educate a dog, but we leave the education of our kids to nothing but our instincts? Shouldn't we help parents understand that the foundation of their children's psyche, health, and intelligence is actually made during pregnancy? And shouldn't we help parents understand that the incentive systems that they apply to the child once it's born, incentive systems like, don't do this or you won't get that, that these incentive systems actually impact the child's later willingness, ability to self-reflect, to be mindful of others, and to contribute to society? We can help parents in this profoundly important phase of bonding right after birth, which so often goes so badly wrong, leaving scars of the child for the rest of its life. The second phase is infancy. Now, our interconnected world is challenging us with complexity, ambiguity, and uncertainty. So understanding emotions is a key success factor 
to understanding yourself, understanding others, and actually finding solutions together. We know that children and infants pick up the sentiments and the feelings of other infants as their own mirror neurons turn their brains into social organs. Infants are born with this. But very often do we tell infants to suppress their emotions. We tell boys, you shouldn't cry. And we tell girls to be nice. And when it comes to describing the complexity of their emotional state, we give kids a very limited vocabulary to play with. Typically, we say you can feel good or bad, happy or sad. That's pretty much it. As a consequence, many adults are discouraged to talk about their emotions, also because this is seen as a weakness, particular in the corporate setting. Many adults don't know really what to say when they're asked, how are you? So typically, the answers we get are hollow and simplistic, like, I'm good, or I'm busy. You can try this at home. See how many different adjectives you can find that describe how you feel at that very moment. I bet you will find it difficult to identify more than 10 different adjectives that describe how you feel at that very moment. But don't use Google, don't cheat. <laughs> but seriously, the problems arise much later in life, when these adults get promoted into leadership roles. And the absence of what we today call emotional intelligence becomes apparent, maybe even an obstacle for success. So then the Human Resources Department goes out and finds an executive coach to train emotional intelligence back into the person. This means that the coach is responsible for reviving a capability that we were all born with, but as we progress through education, adolescence, and as we climb the egoistic career ladder, we forget to use it. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that coaching is a fantastic initiative, but I think that we could advance in the field of emotional intelligence so much faster and so much further if we were to encourage our children to develop their empathetic ability and if we didn't suppress it in early years. The third phase is education. So why is it that during education and higher education, we are told that individualism is the best policy? Why is it that a child in an exam who peeks at its neighbor's exam sheet gets punished? when it is exactly this type of collaborative effort we want to see in an adult in a later professional setting. Only then, of course, in a professional setting, we don't talk about exams, we talk about teamwork. <laughs> so we want the, the adult to actually work with other adults. We want the adult to give his or her best ideas to other adults because we know that this is the foundation for innovation. Yet, the incentive systems that we apply in education are focused on individual success and individual results, creating a me-centered universe. And I believe that this is utterly counterproductive in a world that, like never before, is demanding a collaborative effort. The fourth and final stage is professional life. Many organizations have started building corporate social responsibility teams who are responsible for financing and supporting social initiatives or to showcase an organization's involvement in sustainability efforts. But I believe that so many organizations could create so much more positive impact if they were to see their corporate social responsibility team not as yet another distant individual silo, but rather as providing meaning and value across the entire organization. If an organization were to connect its work in the field of social with its work around leadership development, it could generate so much more innovation and push sustainability to new heights and at the same time drive employee engagement and employer branding like never before. And why have we gotten so hopelessly hooked on numbers and measurement? What happened to creativity and imagination? So many companies still believe that value is calculated in financial terms only. Why is it so difficult for organizations to change, even though so many of their own staff are thirsty for this change and more and more people want to support it? 
Could this have something to do with the individual and the collective self-limiting beliefs? Could it be that in these large structures, nobody has yet come forward to assume responsibility for an organizational redesign that puts social profit at par with financial profit? If not even people like the board member in my earlier story feel empowered enough to challenge the system, who should? Well, we all should. And we all can, because we cannot leave this challenging task only to the CEO and the leaders. So, the convergence of ancient wisdom traditions and new sciences is creating a new worldview for us. It's providing us with purpose, hope, and dignity. And it's providing us with a strong, fantastic basis from which we can initiate a paradigm shift to make the, the world a better place for all and to sustain it. So if I don't want to be caught up in a world where I feel powerless, if I don't want to be ending up in a world of self-limiting beliefs, if I want to be part of the change, I have to stop pointing my finger at other people, hoping that somebody else is responsible and expecting that somebody else will act. And instead, I need to trust that my own behaviors and my own action really do matter. There are many small things we can do, we all can do. You can, for instance, add a simple little exercise to your daily routine. Sit back at the end of the day and reflect on how have I impacted other people around me by what I did and by what I said? How much time have I used up in today's team meeting and how much time was left for others to speak? How sincere was I, really, when I provided feedback to my colleague? How much of what I did and said was actually impacted by my own self-limiting beliefs? And what more could I have done to encourage other people to be more true to themselves? We know that our levels of happiness increase when we help other people. So why don't we build a society where we all feel empowered and where we all act on the basis of equality and balance? I'm thinking of a society where we all give at least as much as we take. Imagine a society where we all act responsibility and in support of one another because we have understood that like the ripple effects in concentric circles, we are all interconnected. This society is achievable. As the experts in the field of swarm intelligence tell us, you need only 5 to 10 percent of any given population to make the rest follow. The society is real, and it might be our only chance to fix the many problems that we have created. It's the kind of society that I want to leave behind for my children and their children. And if we all contribute just a little bit, we can all make it work together. Welcome to a circular society. Thank you. <laughs>